Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Journal Club November 26th, uh, 2021. We have two very exciting um, presentations this morning from two PGY5 uh, residents. We'll start with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the University of Toronto is located on the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit, connected with the dish with one spoon covenant wampum. With this, we respect the longstanding relationships that indigenous nations have to this land as they are the original caretakers. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that indigenous peoples endure in Canada. And we accept responsibility to contribute towards revealing and correcting miseducation, as well as renewing respectful relationships with indigenous communities through our teaching, research and community service. As a reminder, please ensure that your microphones are on mute. Uh, questions and comments can be added to the chat box and uh, there will be time for questions after each presentation. We'll get going with Dr. Janice Lee, PGY5 resident, chief resident and master's um, candidate uh, with a uh, trial on discontinuing beta-lactam antibiotics uh, earlier than uh, traditionally prescribed. Dr. Lee. Great, thank you so much for the um, introduction. And so I'm gonna be presenting on this uh, randomized control trial, discontinuing beta-lactam treatment after three days for patients with community acquired pneumonia or CAP uh, admitted to non-critical care wards. I have no conflicts uh, of uh, interest to disclose. So just to double check, you're able to see my slides, right? Okay, great. So we're going to just uh, review IDSA guidelines uh, for changes over time for community acquired pneumonia, review the evidence uh, for uh, antibiotic treatment duration, and also then critically uh, praise the article. So looking back in the past 20 years, um, there has been historically a treatment duration of seven to 14 days, even up until the first few days uh, for a few, first few editions of the ATS and IDSA guidelines. And the first Canadian guidelines didn't even comment on an antibiotic duration. In uh, 1998, they suggested that uh, streptococcus be treated for uh, until a febrile for 42 hours, 40, sorry, 72 hours, and probably for uh, mycoplasma and chlamydia pneumonias uh, up until two weeks. Uh, and uh, up until these first few guidelines, there was really no RCTs looking at how long pneumonias should be treated for. So over the years, uh, there has been a strong push to reduce antibiotic duration for good reason. There are increasing rates of antimicrobial resistance, such as macrolide-resistant streptococcus. Patient compliance to medication is also a factor. And of course, high cost of drugs to patients and the healthcare system. So this 2007 meta-analysis looked at almost 3,000 patients in 15 RCTs, comparing seven days or less versus more than seven days of antibiotics for mild to moderate CAP. Trials included azithromycin predominantly, where six of 10 trials used only three days of antibiotics. These trials also included uh, use of beta-lactams, fluoroquinolones, and ketolides. This study found uh, no difference in risk of clinical failure, risk of mortality, or bacterial eradication. But one limitation of these studies in the meta-analysis was that the older adults were underrepresented in their study population. So the previous ed edition of the IDSA guidelines in 2007 proposed a duration of antibiotic treatment based on stability criteria. So a minimum of five days of treatment and patients had to be afebrile for 48 to 72 hours. And there can be no more than one uh, cap associated instability criteria, which is listed here in this table. So to validate the 2007 guidelines, there was this non-inferiority trial from JAMA in 2016, showing that there was no difference in clinical success based on signs and symptoms uh, for inpatients with CAP treated for five days of antibiotics versus usual care where the physician determined the duration. So specifically for an even shorter day course, three days of IV antibiotic therapy for moderately to severe CAP is not very well studied. This uh, small non-inferiority trial in 2006 looked at discontinuing IV amoxicillin after three days versus um, comparing to step-down therapy with oral amoxicillin for a total of eight days. 
So stopping antibiotics here for three days uh, was not inferior to a total of eight days of antibiotics um, in adults admitted uh, to hospital with uh, moderately severe pneumonias. The average uh, pneumonia severity index for these patients was class two, which is relatively low risk with a 0.6% mortality at 30 days. And they found no difference in clinical success, radiologic evidence of improvement, and adverse events. So this brings us to the most updated IDSA and ATS guidelines for non-severe inpatient CAP not requiring critical care. They say that the duration of antibiotics suggested should be continued at, uh, at least for five days and until the patient achieves stability. I do wanna draw you uh, to your attention to the choice of antibiotics that's recommended uh, for a severe inpatient cap. Um, the ATS and IDSA guidelines are beta lactam and amacrylide or a fluoroquinolone alone, which is different than European practices, which uh, do recommend monotherapy as well with a non anti pseudomonal cephalosporin. So in the spirit of choosing wisely, this trial attempted a three-day uh, treatment for moderately severe cap admitted to hospital. So the population were adults uh, with moderately severe CAP treated with a beta-lactam monotherapy or IV third generation cephalosporin, and they all had to be clinically stable after three days of treatment. They compared uh, no further antibiotic treatment to an additional five days of antibiotics, and their primary outcome was cure at day 15. They included patients that were age 18 and older with moderately severe CAP moderately severe defined as needing an admission to hospital, but not ICU, and uh, community acquired pneumonia being one clinical sign such as shortness of breath, cough, purulent sputum. They also had to have a fever of 38 degrees within the last 48 hours. And they also had to have a new pulmonary infiltrate on X-ray or CT. They had to be treated with uh, beta lactam monotherapy or IV third generation cephalosporin. And after 72 hours of treatment, they had to be clinically stable. And they defined this as the stability criteria outlined in the 2007 guidelines. They excluded those with severe, complicated, or atypical pneumonias, um, immunosuppressed individuals, healthcare associated pneumonias, aspiration pneumonias. Um, any other infections that require antibiotics for other reasons, and those with severe renal failure. So this uh, study design, it was a double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled, non-inferiority trial in 16 French hospitals' medical wards. They randomly assigned uh, patients one-to-one, -one, stratified by a randomization site and pneumonia severity, and they kept the study uh, drugs blister-packed and dispensed in the pharmacy of each site. And uh, allocation was masked from patients, doctors, investigators, pharmacists, and study coordinators. So this was the study design. Their intervention was oral placebo three times a day for five days after everybody having had three days of uh, IV antibiotics, uh, compared to oral amoxiclav uh, three times a day for five days. On day eight, they assessed their uh, pneumonia uh, symptom questionnaire with a five item uh, questionnaire uh, score. Uh, they also looked at adverse events. On day 15, they took the blister packs from all the participants to assess compliance. And on day 30, they assessed patients with a chest x-ray and looked at their recovery time. Their primary outcome was cure at 15 days after the start of antibiotics, and they defined cure as being a febrile, having improvement in their clinical symptoms, and not needing any further antibiotics. Their secondary uh, outcomes included cure at day 30, all cause mortality, adverse events, their community acquired pneumonia scores, the length of stay in hospital, recovery time, and then they also did a post hoc uh, analysis for compliance for treatment at day 15. So looking at the trial design, this is a non-inferiority trial, which I personally wasn't very familiar with. Um, and so a non-inferiority trial aims to show that an intervention is not unacceptably worse than control. In this type of trial, if shown to be non-inferior, the new treatment can be preferred because of other benefits over the control, such as lower cost, less side effects, maybe easier to administer. And so this is an example of how to interpret a non-inferiority uh, trial force plot. The positive treatment difference um, favors, an inter, uh, favors the intervention, and a negative treatment difference favors the control. And so the study authors determine a non-inferiority margin, and if the results fall to the right of the margin, uh, the intervention is said to be non-inferior. 
You can also declare superiority in a non-inferiority trial if the lower limits of the confidence intervals of the new treatment is above the margin and also above zero. So for this study, the authors declared a non-inferiority margin of 10%. They set the 80% power to show non-inferiority using lower bounds of two-sided 95% confidence intervals of the percent difference in proportion of patients who are cured. They also stratified according to the site and pneumonia severity. And they also did both ITT and per protocol analysis in a post hoc subgroup analysis by age and pneumonia severity. So here are the results. So they took 706 patients um, assessed for eligibility after three days of antibiotic treatment. Um, they did remove 396 patients because a, a majority were not clinically stable. Many had complicated pneumonia, um, significant renal impairment, and a subset had cognitive impairment. And uh, cognitive impairment wasn't originally an exclusion criteria in the protocol, but I suspect they had to take this away because um, a uh, stability cri criteria sorry, was normal mentation. And so in the end, 310 patients were randomized. They evaluated each arm with intention to treat and per protocol analysis. Um, and per protocol analysis looks at the ideal situation where all patients stay in their allocated group and complete the study. Five patients crossed over from the placebo to the beta lactam arm and one did the reverse. And uh, in total, 11 patients were lost to follow up, but this was balanced between the two groups. So here is a part of the table of the trial participants' characteristics. The average age of patients were 72 to 74. Both groups were balanced on sex, degree of comorbidities, smoking status, pneumonia severity, their symptom severity, uh, hematologic and biochemistry results, and radiologic findings. And in this study, the median pneumonia severity uh, was low risk class three, which corresponds to about 2.8% uh, 30 day mortality. So here's a primary outcome of cure at day 15, 77% in the placebo group and 80, uh, sorry, 68% in the beta lactam group. The ITT and per protocol analyses were similar and the risk differences were 9.42 and 9.44 respectively. And being fully on the right hand side of the non-inferiority margin with confidence intervals just crossing below zero, this shows that three days of antibiotics was non-inferior and not superior to a total of eight days. For me, what was impressive was that when they stratified according to age um, and also severity, uh, looking at age groups uh, by decade over age 65, the results also held true for those older than 75. Uh, there are wide confidence intervals in these subgroups because of the small numbers. So briefly reviewing the secondary outcomes, there was no difference in cure at day 30, no difference in mortality, frequency of adverse events, length of stay in hospital or recovery time. The most common reason for lack of cure was uh, no resolution or improvement of symptoms and a need for additional antibiotics for other reasons. So the authors here concluded that stopping beta lactam treatment after three days of um, treatment for inpatients with community acquired pneumonia who were clinically stable was not inferior to those treated for an additional five days. Some of the strengths of the study were that uh, older participants were included, which were not previously well studied in other RCTs. And the results were consistent across subgroups of ages. And of um, 700 patients screened, approximately 40% were unstable or had severe complicated pneumonias or had renal failures. And so for about 60% of the patients that come through the emergency door with uh, pneumonias, a three-day antibiotic treatment course could be relevant for them. And so also for applicability to practice, they used a practical clinical approach to diagnosing pneumonia based on symptoms and imaging without needing microbiolo microbiologic analysis. Now, there are big um, limitations uh, to the study design um, that is a non-inferiority trial. Um, and so results can be biased towards non-inferiority if a trial is poorly designed. And so keeping uh, this in mind, viral etiologies can't be ruled out here. And viral pneumonias approximate about 30% of cases uh, that are diagnosed clinically as uh, just a pneumonia. There were a few patients that were crossed over um, and a small number was lost to follow up. But the authors did show that the per protocol analysis didn't differ significantly from the ITT analysis. Also, beta lactam monotherapy is based on kind of European practices and doesn't quite align with North American and IDSA guidelines. 
And lastly, 31% of patients did have severe um, pneumonia. And so in practice, you have to pay quite close attention to the criteria for stability to consider whether or not your patient um, fits the study. So moving on to critical appraisal, I do think that the patients were appropriately randomized and that the randomization uh, was concealed to the best of their abilities. The study groups were similar uh, at the start of the trial, and there was appropriate 30-day follow-up similar to previous studies uh, with uh, antibiotic treatment duration. Authors performed both an ITT analysis and per protocol analysis to address some of the limitations of a non-inferiority trial design. And patients, physicians, investigators, pharmacists, and coordinators were blinded to treatment, and the groups were e uh, equally treated apart from the intervention. So lastly, I do think that the real results can be applied to our older adults, especially when the study was able to stratify by age and still show that three days of antibiotics was not inferior to eight for those older than 75. However, those with cognitive impairment were excluded. And so um, I think that to be careful here because we see a lot of patients with dementia and delirium. I think these results would be applicable to our cognitively normal adults admitted with a simple pneumonia and that it is feasible to implement in our um, inpatient uh, hospitals. From my experience, I think antibiotics currently given for at least five day total um, is the norm. And so this result in the study might push me to consider not needing to extend antibiotics beyond three days if adults um, have responded really, really well to three days and have limited comorbidities and are cognitively normal. And that's it. Thanks so much. And I'll take questions. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Janice. Uh, excellent uh, delivery, articulation, uh, the slides, and particularly enjoyed the um, explanation and visual description of the non-inferiority uh, trial. Uh, that was great. Um, I'll open it up to questions. I have a question, but perhaps uh, we'll start with the audience. Um, either hand up or please feel free to unmute. Uh, Gary has a question. His hand is up. Please go ahead, Gary. Uh, Janice, great presentation. Uh, just, I guess, to your last point, when you summarized, what proportion of the typical patients that geriatricians tend to get involved with would actually be people that you could consider three days of antibiotics? Because it, it seems probably rather small. Yeah, so I agree. I think uh, on a pure um, geriatric medicine service, um, we are unlikely see to see these patients. Um, but I think a significant number of us also might do hospitalist medicine or uh, GIM. And so I think it's important to also keep this in mind uh, for the spirit of choosing wisely. Thank you. Uh, Janice, I, I wondered uh, the severity um, of these uh, patients in a PSI score of two or three. Uh, I wonder if they would be admitted in our system uh, for oral antibiotics. And um, it seems that most often, if you are eligible for oral antibiotics, you would not be admitted uh, to our system. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting thought in that, you know, this was a French study. And so I'm not exactly sure what the circumstances are in France. Um, if I recall correctly, um, I think more than half of the patients needed oxygen um, when they were first admitted in terms of their demographic criteria. So I think for that set of patients, we would still admit. Um, and so I agree that the average uh, severity of their pneumonia is not as high as what we might typically see here uh, in Toronto. Yeah. And uh, Gary, was that your prior? Um, Janice, uh, I just wanted to ask about uh, external validity issue related to um, choice of antibiotic as the first line antibiotic uh, and whether you think that the result uh, can be uh, extended uh, to North America or, you know, to our uh, jurisdiction where we probably use a different first choice uh, antibiotic. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I wouldn't say I, I've read a whole lot into this, but I think there are recent um, articles looking at uh, monotherapy um, that uh, might give us a better idea. I, I don't recall them off the top of my head, but there are quite a few trials recently looking at um, non-inferiority of monotherapy versus combined therapy. So I would look into that. Thank you. Uh, Shabir's hand is up. Uh, sorry, Murray, for the last question, we'll go to Shabir, uh, mindful of time. Shabir. 
Thanks, Janice. Uh, great presentation. Given that we see a lot of younger old and older old and that probably immunosenescence or immunodysregulation increases with age, and my question is, do you think there are enough patients or enough theoretical concerns to be worried about the very old with pneumonia, like the 85-year-olds, the 90-year-olds? Can we apply this study to them or, or not? What are your thoughts? And I know it's a, it's a hard question, but I'd be interested to, to know what you think. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting because um, one of the criteria is like being afebrile, right? And we know that our older adults don't mount a fever. And so maybe using those stability criteria might not specifically apply to our oldest of old. And so I think we always have to take a grain of salt with um, the issues here. And I think this uh, sorry, stability criteria is quite strict too. And so with our uh, older adults with a lot of comorbidities, I don't think that they would necessarily fit into the trial criteria. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Janice, for the excellent uh, presentation. I guess we'll look forward to future guidelines and see how this RCT may impact them. And thank you for the rich uh, discussion. Uh, for the interest of time, we will move on. Our next uh, present presenter is Dr. Alex Day, PGY5 Geriatric uh, Medicine. Um, and for his presentation, we extend a warm welcome to Dr. Paul O, oh, a content expert, um, a cardiologist, a specialist in a rehab uh, cardiologist. And so uh, Dr. Day, please um, uh, unmute and feel free to share your slides. Okay, uh, thanks Dr. Gandel. And uh, for anyone out there who uh, doesn't know me, I'm um, Alex Day, PGY5 in geriatric medicine. So uh, I'm going to be speaking today about a recent study titled uh, Physical Rehabilit Rehabilitation for Older Patients Hospitalized for Heart Failure, or titled Rehab HF. And we'll be specifically looking at how we can optimize cardiac rehab uh, in our frail older adults. So I do not have any disclosures. Uh, this is um, the study, and just to um, show you guys that this was in the New England Journal of Medicine, so we, we know that it's important. So here are the research questions that uh, the study sought to answer. So firstly, uh, will a tailored rehab intervention program improve physical performance and reduce rehospitalization in frail older patients after being admitted to hospital for acute heart failure? And then also they're trying to look at uh, whether frailty can be used as a therapeutic target in older patients with heart failure. So first, uh, a little bit of uh, background information about uh, the relationship between frailty and heart failure. Uh, so I think uh, as we've all come to, to know, um, acute decompensated heart failure is a leading cause of hospitalization among older adults. About one in seven heart failure hospitalizations occur in patients over 80. Uh, and many studies have demonstrated that frailty uh, can be a risk marker for adverse outcomes in heart failure. So the relationship between frailty and heart failure are quite uh, interrelated. Uh, both frailty and heart failure deal with multi-system dysfunction. Uh, and in, in both cases, uh, you can have these vicious cycles of decline. Uh, so in frailty, um, we see patients who have um, many comorbidities, they suffer from sarcopenia, uh, they have decreased exercise tolerance, inflammation, and all these taken together lead to an increased risk of heart failure. Uh, and in our heart failure patients, again, we see patients with lots of comorbidities. Uh, they suffer from sort of sarcopenia, lots of um, uh, inflammation, exercise and tolerance goes down, and they have an increased risk of frailty. So these are quite interrelated. Following hospitalization for heart failure, older frail, frail adults have been shown that they um, can, in some cases, uh, have a lot of difficulty recovering to their baseline function. They will often lose their independence, and they have a very high risk of rehospitalization and death after discharge. So taking uh, the significance of frailty and heart failure in mind, um, a lot of studies have sought uh, to see uh, what type of interventions uh, can try to reduce the risks uh, in patients with heart failure and who are uh, frail. Now, Unfortunately, as is often the case uh, with um, our population that we tend to deal with, 
most studies uh, who, um, whose aim is to uh, help these populations actually end up excluding most older patients, those with com multiple com comorbidities and those with frailty. Um, as well, a lot of the studies that have come before mostly focus on endurance training as a way uh, to improve outcomes after uh, having heart failure or, or admission for heart failure. Endurance training being things like um, uh, a stationary spin bike uh, or a six minute uh, walk distance uh, testing. So two previous studies that I'll highlight that were two of the, the largest um, are HF Action in 2009. And this was a study that was looking at um, aerobic exercise training for 36 weeks, once a week, uh, in people with heart failure. And unfortunately it showed uh, a non-significant reduction in all-cause mortality and hospitalization. Uh, the other study uh, that's more recent is Ejection AF. This study was a little bit different uh, in that it looked at uh, patients who had just recently been admitted to hospital with heart failure. Uh, and it was a supervised exercise program, 36 sessions in 24 weeks. Uh, but again, it didn't lead to significant reduction in mortality or rehospitalization. And of note, in both of these studies, um, by the end of um, the intervention period, um, people uh, or those in the intervention groups were only participating uh, with the exercises around 45%. So let's jump into the study I'm here to talk about today. So the hypothesis um, is that an early tailored and progressive rehab intervention will improve uh, both physical function and reduce the rates of rehospitalization at six months. So the study was multi-center, randomized, uh, only single blinding and uh, was controlled trial with enrollment between 2014 and 2019. So uh, just missed the beginning of the pandemic. So it's all uh, it's a pre-pandemic study. Uh, in terms of inclusion criteria, I'll, I'll just highlight uh, two points here. Um, they specifically were looking at people over the age of 60. So again, they're, they're really, they were trying to target the older frail population. Um, but then they also had part of their inclusion criteria, the ability to walk four meters at the time of enrollment. And something maybe we'll touch on a little bit later uh, in the presentation is, um, that the study did not indicate at what point in someone's hospitalization uh, they were uh, determining their ability to walk four meters. Um, so that's uh, one um, uh, thing to keep in mind. In terms of exclusion criteria, they were trying to exclude those with dementia, um, as well as those who were um, uh, on the sicker side. And then also highlight that, um, again, in an effort to try to, to target frailer patients, uh, they excluded those who uh, were already uh, engaged in vigorous exercise programs before coming to hospital. So uh, to uh, whittle down um, the patients enrolled in the study, uh, they first began with 27,300 um, electronic records uh, that were reviewed. Uh, and then you'll see here that 26,890, so over 98% of those were excluded based on uh, either not meeting the inclusion criteria or uh, meeting the exclusion criteria. And I'll just highlight again, uh, the number of people who were excluded uh, because um, they weren't able to walk four meters, didn't have uh, clinical stability uh, or had dementia. So eventually they, they whittled this down to 410 patients who they went to see in person to screen for eligibility into the study. Um, and of these 410 patients, again, um, they excluded 61 to come down to a final number of 349, and these 349 underwent randomization, um, so 175 into the intervention group and 174 into the control group. So we'll dive into table one, and I'll go into each section individually. So I'll highlight here that um, the age uh, was around 73 in both groups, um, so uh, an older um, population. Uh, and then also a population uh, in both groups that had multiple comor comorbidities, so an average of, of five coexisting conditions uh, in both groups. And then again, uh, they were using um, uh, or trying to find frailer patients. Uh, so by using the FREED criteria, um, they included 97% of people in the study that were either frail or pre-frail uh, in the study. 
So we'll look at now what exactly they were doing for their intervention, what makes their intervention special compared to previous studies. Uh, and I'll, I'll just say again that um, what uh, this study is doing is trying to use an intervention that's early, tailored, and progressive. So there are three phases uh, to the intervention. Uh, it takes place uh, over six months total. So the first phase is the inpatient phase. So once uh, they found a patient who was um, to be included in the study, um, they began um, 45 minutes of physiotherapy uh, every day with that patient. Uh, and then upon discharge, uh, they'd have the patient, if able, to come to a facility three days per week to do 60 minutes of exercise for 12 weeks, so 36 total sessions. If the patient wasn't able to make it to the facility, they would send a physiotherapist uh, to the home uh, to do uh, the same program with them at home until they were able to attend the outpatient facility. Um, the outpatient uh, piece of things uh, went on for a total of three months. And then they'd had a, a maintenance phase. So for the latter three months, uh, from three months to six months, uh, they would design an individualized exercise program for each patient. Um, and they would be checking in uh, every four weeks uh, to discuss with the patient how their progress was going, answer any questions about the program, and encourage them uh, to continue uh, the program as best as they could. Uh, and again, what makes this this program special is that rather than focusing only on endurance, uh, their exercise programs targeted four different domains, strength, mobility, balance, and endurance. Uh, and um, the idea here was that, uh, as we all know, and uh, we all recognize, um, if we want someone um, to improve their walking, uh, but they have no balance, um, they're not going to be able uh, to work on their six minute walk time very well until we address their balance issues. So the program would highlight where and which in which domain um, needed the most help. And then the, the exercise program would target that domain pr predominantly until uh, it was uh, improved enough that the other domains could then be focused on. Uh, and then once um, uh, they had that program um, figured out, they would uh, send uh, the patients uh, to continue these programs at home uh, in their own time. For the control arm, um, they received um, usual care. Uh, so uh, if the medicine team determined at the time of discharge from hospital uh, that they should be enrolled in a rehab program to have physiotherapy come to the home, to have OT come to the home, uh, they would receive these interventions. Uh, and about 43% of the control group received either routine PTOT or uh, a rehab program. So the primary outcome uh, was uh, physical uh, function. It was measured based on the short physical performance battery. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with um, the SBBP, uh, it's looking at uh, three different um, exercises. So firstly, it's measuring balance testing. Um, so first, you're going to have your feet together. If you can do that, great. Then semi-tandem and then full tandem. Um, and you get a score based on your ability to balance in those positions. Uh, and then it's going to measure your strength by doing chair rises without using your arms. And then it's going to measure your gait speed. And from uh, these three um, exercises, uh, they're going to give you a score out of 12, uh, and 12 being a better physical performance. The secondary outcome was the six month rate of rehospitalization for any cause. And then they also measured uh, many other outcomes uh, focused on measuring general physical function, quality of life, depression, cognition, uh, and falls. Okay, so uh, in terms of our results, um, you can see here from the graph that um, the mean score on the short physical performance battery uh, did improve in a significant way. So at baseline, both groups had an SPPB score of six out of 12. Uh, and in the intervention group, um, the improve, they improved from six to 8.3, um, which was a mean uh, improvement of about 1.5 better than the um, control group, uh, which was significant, which was a significant improvement. Unfortunately, rehospitalization rates um, were um, better, but not significantly so. So 
uh, for the intervention group, uh, 1.18 rehospitalization rate, and in the control group, a 1.28 um, rehospitalization rate. And then some other results to just show you um, in uh, those other outcomes, we did see some significant improvement in the intervention group. So for the six minute walk distance, there was a significant improvement at the three month point. And the KCCQ questionnaire, which uh, is a questionnaire that tries to measure quality of life in those with heart failure, there was an improvement uh, in the intervention group, a significant improvement compared to uh, control. Uh, for the uh, free frailty scale, uh, although it wasn't quite um, significant, uh, it was very close to a significant reduction um, in frailty status uh, compared to uh, the control group. And then lastly, uh, there was a significant improvement in the uh, geriatric depression scale in the intervention compared to control. And then uh, importantly, um, at the six month point, they did find that 83% of, of the intervention group reported regular home exercise. And this is a, a vast improvement compared to previous studies, as I pointed out before, where um, it was closer to around 40, 45%. Uh, so the authors conclude that among older frail patients hospitalized for acute decompensated heart failure, a tailored progressive rehab intervention focusing on multiple functional domains, and that began either uh, during or early hospitalization, resulted in significantly greater improvement in physical function than usual care. However, it didn't show an improvement in rehospitalization rate. So in terms of our appraisal of this study, um, was the assignment of patients uh, to treatments randomized? Yes, it was. Uh, were the groups similar at the start of the trial? I'd say that they were um, in terms of baseline characteristics of age, comorbidities, frailty, uh, NYHA class, and length of hospitalization. They were similar uh, in both groups. And then um, aside from the allocated treatment, were the groups treated equally? Uh, now, difficult uh, in this study to blind, to have double blinding, uh, as the intervention group is obviously going to know uh, that um, they're receiving um, extra treatment. So uh, I think because of this, there is a high risk of bias that that intervention group uh, might have received some increased attention. Um, and then uh, the other point is that uh, going back to when they collected their baseline data, it's unclear um, when exactly they were determining or when they were uh, selecting patients and measuring baseline criteria during their hospitalization. And the concept of delirium is completely ignored during, within this study. And this strikes me as kind of unusual because I think as we would uh, all agree, many of uh, these patients who are older, frail, and come into hospital for um, decompensated heart failure uh, show up pretty delirious. Uh, and so um, I, I, did, I was left wondering um, whether or not they were allowing for delirium to resolve before they were um, measuring baseline criteria or not, or if those uh, who were in the midst of delirium were simply excluded and filed under um, a cognitive impairment. So that's not so clear to me. Um, and so then uh, were all patients in the trial accounted for? Uh, as we touched on earlier, there was a very, very high rate of exclusion, uh, which I think does raise some uh, doubts about the possible uh, transferability of the results to the real world. Uh, but otherwise, of those that were enrolled, um, uh, we had some deaths more in the inter intervention group than in the control, but not significantly so. Um, and then um, an equal amount just about were lost to fall off in both groups. And then were measures taken to ensure ob objectivity? Uh, yeah, so they were unable to double blind as mentioned, uh, but the people who were assessing outcomes uh, were blinded uh, during the study. Uh, and so then just to analyze a bit deeper, uh, some of the results we talked about, uh, as we discussed, the intervention group did have a significantly greater improvement in physical function at three months. And the mean difference between the control group uh, and the intervention group in terms of the uh, SPPV score was 1.5. And looking at what's a clinically important difference in the SPP scale, it's about 0.5. So at three times that number uh, within only three months uh, is, I think, um, pretty impressive. 
And then also to point out that uh, in some of those secondary outcomes, um, the six minute walk distance, the quality of life indicators, the frailty status and the depression scale, these all improve in, in, in the intervention group, which I think uh, does indicate an overall benefit uh, to the intervention. And then finally, uh, the people um, in the inter intervention group really stuck with the exercises during the maintenance phase. Uh, and this might suggest that uh, there was a behavior change. And I agree that they were getting telephone calls every four weeks, but still uh, to have um, over 80% of those uh, in uh, the intervention stage still doing the study, still doing the exercise at home, uh, I thought was quite impressive. And then of course, no significant difference in rate of rehospitalization, uh, but uh, I would guess, and it, it, my hypothesis would be, if the study was carried out for another six months, I think I would guess that um, based on the improvement in physical function, seen after three months, we would see uh, perhaps a significant impact on the rate of rehospitalization if uh, these patients were followed for longer. So how does this help us caring for our patients? Um, so I would say that other than the age being a little bit younger than most people we see in hospital, um, the patients that they tried to include in their study are similar in that they are community dwelling, uh, frailer, uh, older adults who have multiple comorbidities. Uh, they did try to exclude dementia. Um, and as I talked about, it's unclear uh, how many of these patients uh, had uh, delirium or were delirious at the, at the point of enrollment. Uh, and the next question, uh, is the treatment feasible in my setting? Uh, yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, and luckily we have Dr. Paul O here, um, who I'm hoping uh, can say a bit more about um, the feasibility of the study and, and what's currently being done in the cardiac rehab scene at UHN uh, for frail older, older adults. And Paul, I'll bring you on in just a second. And then finally, um, will the potential benefits outweigh potential harms? Absolutely, very uh, few um, adverse events and no significant difference uh, in adverse events or deaths between groups. So bottom line, this was a single blinded uh, RCT that provides, I think, compelling evidence for the adoption of an early tailored and progressive rehab program for frail older adults with acute heart failure. Uh, I think also importantly, this study helps to solidify frailty as a therapeutic target in older heart failure patients uh, when trying to improve physical function. And then finally, um, I was in a lecture last week uh, where Dr. Ken Rockwood spoke about frailty. And this was a quote for him during that lecture. He said, uh, the best evidence for treatment of frailty is exercise, and in particular, an exercise program that can be maintained. And I think that this study um, really uh, nails that point, uh, which is that if we can have our frail older adults um, maintaining an exercise program, that's the key. And, and that's what this study showed. So thank you so much for listening, guys. And uh, I'd like to open the floor up to uh, Dr. Paul O, if you wouldn't mind uh, unmuting, maybe you can tell us a bit more about uh, what um, the cardiac rehab scene in Toronto is like and compare and contrast that to the study. Great. Thanks, Alex. And uh, good morning to all of you. Um, if I could just start by um, uh, doing a minor correction to, to my background bio. I'm not a cardiologist. I'm, I'm an internist and pharmacologist, actually, by background and trained uh, back in the day with, with Barb Blue and, and others. So it's good to see many of you again. Um, so, so cardiac rehab in Toronto, indeed, we've, we've got a nice program at UHN. Uh, we see about 2,000 people per year at both the Toronto Rehab site and uh, Toronto Western site. Uh, uh, Gary and, and, and Barry in, in previous careers would have been very, very familiar with what happens at Toronto Rehab. Um, I must say that the delivery model, especially during pandemic, is rather different than what's, uh, what's being delivered in, in, the, in the study. It is great to see a cardiac rehab profiled in New England uh, with, with you know, a relatively small number of people, but it's, it's great that there is that profile. Um, I think we would all appreciate there was a lot of therapy that was given to these folks, you know, 45 minutes a day, every day inpatient, and then leading to outpatient one-on-one, -on -one, uh, many visits, extended period of time. Um, and, and there are no programs that can actually offer that much intensity, but, but certainly the intent and the principles are very compatible where we focus not only on endurance, but also strength and mobility. 
mobility and balance and flexibility. Uh, that's critically important. Uh, and I like how you've emphasized, Alex, that we should uh, not focus so much on endurance training, especially when people might need more strength training, certainly at the beginning, just to get mobile out of a chair, et cetera. Uh, so that the combination of, of interventions is really important. Uh, having exercise professionals in our lives uh, is really important. And we all lean on PTs, OTs, nurses, others, but we also rely on kinesiologists in a very big way in cardiac rehab and, and, and that's available. Um, uh, models of delivery currently in, in Toronto will involve much less frequent in-person contact because of pandemic restrictions and modifications of programming. So we don't see people three times a week for 12 weeks. We're gonna see them once weekly uh, for a period of an, a few weeks and then move into kind of virtual uh, supports. So much lower intensity, but I do believe uh, that we can actually deliver effective interventions. Um, one measure that was not included in the study was actually a, 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 an index of fitness, direct measure of fitness, like uh, oxygen co uh, consumption of, or VO2. And uh, that's what we measure in our program in all patients and can show that that actually does improve significantly. That tracks with survival um, and that can um, uh, apply for both younger and older people. Uh, final thought, and, and, and there's others that want to comment. Uh, on the note of hospital admissions, I think you quite uh, rightly noted that um, you know, the direction was, was positive, and, uh, but, but it's a relatively small number, short period of time, as you've uh, indicated, Alex. The most re recent Cochrane analysis of heart failure, cardiac rehab interventions sh showed that there actually was a significant reduction in heart failure admissions, uh, but you know, there, there's a few thousand in each of the arms uh, for that analysis. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions or, 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 or support Alex anyway. Thanks, Dr. Rose. I really appreciate you being here this morning. It's, uh, and thanks so much for um, uh, the words. Uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Gendel. Uh, no, thank you both, and uh, forgive me, Dr. O, for um, uh, miss uh, the uh, error in the introduction. No, I'm no. very grateful for your presence and uh, to add to the richness of uh, the discussion. So uh, Gary has his hand up. We'll uh, go to Gary first. Uh, maybe Gary dropped off. Murray, no, I'm still, I'm still here. I'm still no, here. Gotcha. Great to see you, Paul. Uh, thanks for the great presentation, uh, Alex. I'd like to focus on methods, if I may, for a bit. Uh, and I have sort of three general comments to make. Um, one, I think, Paul, which Paul alluded to, this is a relatively small study. Like when you really want to prove an intervention, a, you need hundreds, usually, if not more, to be convincing. And um, if we do the, the Nagley eyeball test on table one, I would uh, disagree a bit with you, Alex. I think there are a fair number of differences actually between the, the two groups. Uh, it's hard to know um, how important those were, but there are quite a few. And I'll, I'll remind the group that uh, table one characteristics are not meant to be subjected to hypothesis testing because we don't have a hypothesis about them. It's traditionally done, but the smaller the sample sizes, the rest re less relevant that is because with small sample sizes, you need huge differences between groups to actually have statistical significant differences between them. Uh, that does not suggest though that the groups may not be quite different from each other. The second, uh, and I, I think really important point I'd like to make, and uh, I really owe a lot to my psychology colleagues that I collaborate with for hammering this home to me is the control group. And, uh, how, how good was the control here to convince us that the intervention, specifically the exercise intervention, was uh, the primary difference in the results that we're looking at? And when I look at the difference between uh, the number of in-person group sessions and one-on-ones with the intervention group compared to the control group, plus the intensive follow-up by phone, uh, in the intervention group compared to the control group. Uh, I must say that I'm not convinced that social elements of this and other elements may too have played an important difference. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it creates a bit of a challenge. It's typical to use usual care as a control, but as my psychology 
colleagues have taught me, it makes it more difficult to really tease out what differences really uh, contribute to differences uh, in results. And the last comment- Dr. Nagley, can, can, I just, can I just address that one? Um, then yes, we can yes, one. It would be sure. easier that way. Yes, well, sure. I, I, I totally agree with you um, in essence, but I also think that um, the intervention um, should be seen as a whole. It's, it's not just about the exercise itself per se. I think that the amount of time they had ch to check in on people, um, that counts as the intervention. The, uh, the ability of, for them to go to the house and have someone come to the house, make sure they have the necessary uh, equipment, space, uh, and uh, understand the program, how to do it. Uh, and that type of encouragement is part of the intervention. Um, and I don't see, uh, I, I know Dr. Uh, o mentioned that sometimes resources can be limited, but I think part of what's, what makes this intervention um, um, uh, one that showed positive benefit was that they, they did um, act on the social side of things. I don't disagree with that, Alex. I guess the, the question I raise is, what is the uh, magic sauce? So what, what is the ingredient? Because uh, I, I suggest, as Paul probably alluded to, the feasibility of doing this in, in our health system is pretty low because it's so resource intensive. Um, but um, so the, the point being, if you want, want to really understand uh, what differences matter, you need to, uh, I guess, choose control groups that match for characteristics. Uh, and I, you know, if you're suggesting it, it's the combination of the intensive, intensiveness, the, uh, you know, in-home, uh, the social elements, I don't disagree. Uh, it just doesn't allow us, I guess, to tease out perhaps what might be the most important ingredient. Ingredients. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree that uh, we don't we don't know uh, uh, what piece of the puzzle uh, was the one that made the difference, and I I think also that that points to your initial uh, point, which was that it's a small study. Uh, so I, I don't think I don't think with this limited number of participants we're going to be able to tell that, that piece. But that is a design flaw, no doubt. And was there a third point also? Yeah, it's just with small groups like this, uh, looking at adverse events, uh, uh, which are relatively rare, we can't really say anything because if I wanted to be an alarmist, I'd say twice as many people died in, in the intervention group, 12 versus six in the control group. Uh, but if we want to be methodologists, all we could say is that it's not adequately powered for us to really look at those types of outcomes. It's, it's, yeah, it's, of course. And uh... I was going to make a joke to say that uh, those of you looking at the, the group differences in, in death uh, might point to the study as an excuse not to be exercising, um, but uh, I think that would be a mistake. <laughs> Aries, thanks again for a great presentation, Alex. Thanks, Dr. Nagley. Thank you very much. Perhaps I'll just get to a few of the comments. Murray, I, I will get to your question. I have a few comments in the chat box. So Alex, uh, from Rachel Johnston, one of your colleagues, uh, can you comment on the etiology of heart failure and the injection fraction at enrollment? I, I know that there was NYHA class. Uh, can you comment on the etiology of heart failure, I presume, ischemic? Uh, yeah, I think um, they, they did look into the etiology of heart failure. Um, and um, you know, I can't recall off the top of my head uh, if they broke it down. Um, but what they did do um, specifically is they tried to... Um, make sure that they, they kept uh, close track of those with preserved and those with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, and actually they, they've um, recently released um, another study looking exactly um, at that subset, of, uh, that subset of preserved ejection fraction and whether or not this intervention um, uh, had a significant um, impact on, on that population. Um, and so if you want more information about uh, those different groups, I think that, that more recent study would be um, helpful. Thank you. And Paul Katz, thank you for joining us. Alex, was there any information related to home supports given the high rate of continued exercise at six months and the fact that the average MOCA was 21? Yeah, this is a great question. So no, um, they don't talk about uh, home supports so much. They, all they allude to is that um, they did have a team go to the house to, as I, uh, I mentioned before, make sure that uh, the home uh, was uh, had the space and the equipment uh, uh, to do the exercise program at home. Um, 
and then I agree with you. Part of what I was so impressed by uh, they um, they do show that um, those people who were most frail and had the lowest MOCA scores actually benefited the most um, from uh, the study. And again, we're talking about small numbers here, so I didn't really highlight it, um, but um, I thought that was that was interesting, uh, which which to me showed that the program. Um, probably perhaps wasn't um, overly complicated and allowed people uh, who did have some amount of cognitive impairment uh, to participate. Thank you. Uh, Camilla posted the economic analysis that Barry referred to in the chat box. Um, the audience can feel free to click on that. Murray, if you're still there, can you please unmute and uh, um, we welcome yes. your question. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add as a former physiotherapist, I like to tell people the brain is not just to think, it is also to move. And in people who have congestive heart failure, studies have shown that one third have cerebrovascular disease cognitive impairment. And it's really subcortical changes that have to, that affect executive function the most. And we know that exercise um, and helps that a part you know, of executive function and it helps with mood. And when they do a functional MRI, they see that exercise can actually make changes um, in that part of the brain. So a very interesting study and a very rich uh, conversation. And thank you for the very clear presentation. Thank you, Marie. Uh, Dr. O. Hey, uh, Dove, thanks. Uh I recognize that the time is moving on. And I just want to put in this plug before you, you wrap up that um, uh, we're certainly interested in working together with the geriatric programs and uh, designing, uh, improving our interventions. Uh, I really like that Alex has kind of raised the notion that exercise may be one of the, the, the best interventions that we can offer to our, to our community. Uh, I know Barb is a big fan of this. We've, we've done things together in, in, in seminars and I know Shabir has been such a champion uh, for older individuals with cancer. But if you've got great ideas, and I know you have great ideas on how we can modify, work together on a collaborative rehab program for the older uh, older group is this might be a really great new program that we can uh, devise together. Um, so putting that out as what do you do with Journal Club afterwards, uh, this, this could be a really good thing. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you again. Uh, very grateful uh, for your participation and uh, insightful uh, uh, comments and, and uh, rich discussion. Thank you, Alex. Uh, beautiful presentation. Um, uh, applause in, in, the, um, in the reactions. Uh, maybe one last question before the announcements. Marjorie Hammond in the chat box asked, how did they measure psychosocial factors? Sure, so, um, uh, hey Marjorie. Uh, they, they had some um, quality of life indicators um, that, um, I guess actually that's not a psychosocial factor. Psychosocial factors, I, I, I guess they, I guess they, they I guess I'm not so, that term is so vague. I'm not sure exactly how to answer your question specifically. They, they did have um, the geriatric, geriatric depression scale um, and some quality of life indicators involved uh, that they did at baseline and then again at three months, um, but they weren't measuring things like uh, income um, or other type of social uh, measures. Thank you. And with that, we will wrap up Journal Club for this morning. Very rich discussion. Thank you all for joining. Please remember to complete your evaluations. Uh, the email link should have been sent to you. And the next Journal Club is in mid-December uh, due to the holiday break. So as a warning, advance warning, December 17th, mid-December uh, due to the holiday break. We look forward to seeing you uh, then. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.